Okay, we are going to break Richard Nixon's presidency up into three parts. Part one, part two, and part three. The first part, we've got to talk about some things to set the stage. Now, do you remember when we were back in the Lyndon Johnson administration, we said that after Bobby Kennedy saw the successes of Eugene McCarthy running against the incumbent president, Lyndon Johnson, he decided to throw his hat into the ring to gain the Democratic nomination. So you actually had Senator McCarthy of Minnesota, Senator Kennedy of New York, which we'll explain to you later, and Lyndon Johnson vying for the Democratic nomination, which is really unusual, because usually when an incumbent wants to re, you know, run again, there's no competition. Well, we know that Lyndon Johnson announced on March 31st of 1968 that he would not seek the Democratic nomination, so it left the Democratic Party wide open, and the front runners are going to be Eugene McCarthy of Minnesota, which we'll talk about, and Robert Kennedy. But prior to Kennedy getting an opportunity to run for the presidency in the general election, he's assassinated. And that's what we're going to start with today, is the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy. Now remember, he's running in the primaries against who? Eugene McCarthy and others that have maybe claimed they're going to run. <clears throat> well, when Senator Robert Kennedy of New York was campaigning for the Democratic nomination for president in 1968, he ran on the following three issues. He ran on the following three issues. This was what he was running on, his platform, if he was going to be nominated for the Democratic Party. Remember, he's running in the primary election just for the nomination of the Democratic Party. The first issue he would run on would be the issue of social reform. <clears throat> Who wants to tell me what social reform is? Well, think social reform. And probably trying to help which class survive? The lower class. So social reform is reforming the social classes and trying to help the less privileged. The second thing he campaigned on was to reach out to poor people and minority groups. To reach out to poor people and minority groups. Okay? And the third thing that Robert Kennedy was campaigning on is, take a guess. Civil rights. No, close. What's the big debate in 68? Vietnam. Vietnam. So he will run as an advocate for withdrawing from Vietnam. He saw no military victory in sight. So he will run on the issues of social reform. He will run on the issue of reaching out to poor people and minority groups and he will run on the issue of withdrawing from Vietnam. He does not see it as a winnable war. Now, you have to go to these different states and, and campaign in the primary. And it just happened that this swing that he was on at this time, in June of 1968, was in South Dakota and California. Those were the two, two states he was working in, and he was heading on to Chicago, Illinois, after California. So he was hitting these states in the primaries and campaigning. So uh, South Dakota and California were the states that he was in in early June. And his plan was once he got through South Dakota campaigning and California campaigning, then he was heading to Illinois, mainly Chicago. Okay? So he figured if he could get victories, especially in California and Illinois, that it would open him up to probably gain that Democratic nomination for president at the convention in 1968. He thought those were two key states. So what city in California, he's already been through South Dakota, what city in California is he, is he in campaigning? Los Angeles. Los Angeles. So he's in downtown Los Angeles, he's been all the way through California, but he's in Los Angeles and he's just found out that he has won the Democratic primary in Los Angeles in the primary. He defeated his opponents. So he had he won a California primary victory. And what that does is it tells him at the convention later 
that California more than likely is going to give them their delegate vote so he can be nominated. So he's got this California primary victory. He's pretty excited. And he decides shortly after midnight on June 5th, so it's June 5th, shortly after midnight. Don't get those confused. And he's in the ballroom of the Ambassador Hotel, which is on your ID sheet. And he's going to give a victory speech. So we're looking at so you don't get confused because it's easy. It's June 4th. It just turned midnight, so it's June 5th. So just after midnight on June 5th, it just turned June 5th, he's giving, he and his, he's giving a victory speech at the Ambassador Hotel. And he's got an entourage around him, you know, supporters that are around him, his wife and, and friends and whatever. So he gives this victory speech, which you'll see, and the last comment he, he makes, he thanks them for all their help and his supporters, and he goes on to Chicago and, let, and let's win there. And he sh shows up the victory sign and walks off the podium. Okay? Now, he's trying to avoid the media barrage that he knows he's going to get. So the fastest way to get out of the hotel and into the waiting cars was to go through the kitchen area. Okay? So they had this planned out. Now remember, they don't have secret service for political candidates at this time. So the people protecting him are his entourage. And they make the decision that it would be much quicker to go through the kitchen rather than try to get out a different way. And if they went through the kitchen, they would avoid most of the media. So again, after his remarks, Kennedy and his entourage exited the hotel through the kitchen area. As he was going through the kitchen area, he was shaking hands with well-wishers and kitchen staff and hotel staff as he made his way through. And as he began to exit the kitchen, a young man stepped in front of him and shouted, Kennedy, you son of a bitch. Okay? So he's walking through the kitchen. He's shaking hands with hotel staff, kitchen staff, different people. And as he's beginning to make his exit out of the kitchen, a young man stepped in front of him and yelled, Kennedy, you son of a bitch. After yelling that obscenity, the young man fired a 22 caliber revolver several times towards Kennedy and his entourage. So after yelling, Kennedy, you son of a bitch, he pulls out a 22 caliber revolver and empties it into Kennedy's entourage and in his direction. Now, this young man was immediately detained by three of Kennedy's entourage who captured him immediately. They're all on your ID sheet. One was a journalist by the name of George Plimpton. The other was an Olympic gold medalist in the decathlon, Rayford Johnson, and professional football player, Rosie Greer. So this, the assailant was immediately captured by three of Kennedy's entourage. A journalist by the name of George Plimpton, an Olympic gold medalist in the decathlon, excuse me, Rafer Johnson, and a professional football player that played for the Los Angeles Rams by the name of Rosie Greer. Those were the three men, again, that captured the assailant. Journalist George Plimpton, Olympic gold medalist in the decathlon, Rafer Johnson, and professional football player Rosie Greer. Now, ironically, as what happened in the Oswald attempt, remember the police captured Oswald, what did M.N. McDonald do when Oswald fired his gun? No. He grabbed his gun, member and caught his, his thumb between the uh, firing pin and the hammer. Greer did the same thing. He jammed his thumb behind the trigger of the revolver to prevent further shots from being fired. So he fired several shots, and then Greer wrestled his hand into the revolver, putting his thumb behind the trigger to prevent further shots. Now, no one got any footage of the shooting. 
but the scuffle afterwards was recorded on an audio tape by a reporter by the name of Andrew West. So nobody got the shooting broadcast live at the time. That doesn't mean we didn't have pictures of it later, but remember how Oswald was shot on live TV? That wasn't the case with Bobby Kennedy. Nobody got a live shot of the, of the uh, shooting. But the scuffle afterwards was recorded on an audio tape by reporter Andrew West. Where did the shots go? The question being, where did these shots end up? Well, Senator Kennedy was shot twice in his back and once right behind his right ear. He was shot twice in the back and once behind the right ear. Twice in the back and once behind the right ear. Very close range. The assailant was not far from Robert Kennedy. As he lay bleeding on the floor, guess what the first thing Robert Kennedy asked? What? No? No? Compassion. First thing he asked. Several shots fired. Anybody else get hurt? Unfortunately, five other people were hit during this shooting. Five other people were wounded. They're on your ID sheet. And actually, I have two of them up here, if you're interested in looking later. Two of them up here who have signed signatures of guys that were hit in the shooting of Kennedy. Okay? So here are the five people that were wounded. William Wessel. He was 30 years old and worked for ABC News. That's on your ID sheet. And his picture of him laying in the hospital bed and his signature is over there if you want to look at it later. Paul Schrade. He was 43 and was a member of the United Auto Workers Union who happened to be there supporting Kennedy. Paul Schrade. 43, member of the United Auto Workers Union. Elizabeth Evans. 43 years old, was a Democratic Party activist. Elizabeth Evans, age 43, a Democratic Party activist. Oh. Yep, I'll repeat them too, yep. So did he get all eight shots out of them? Got them all, pretty much. Well, there were, no, not all of them, but he hit a lot of people. So like, he, seven out of eight hit. Wow. Ira Goldstein. He was just 19 and was a radio reporter. Ira Goldstein, age 19, a radio reporter. I'll repeat him again. Is he the only one that died? We'll take okay. And the final person wounded in the shooting was Irvin Stroll. Irwin Stroll. He was 17 and simply a Kennedy campaign volunteer. So other than Kennedy being hit, William Wessel, age 30, of ABC News. Paul Schrade, age 43, United Auto Workers. Elizabeth Evans, age 43, a Democratic Party activist. Ira Goldstein, 19, a radio reporter. And Erwin Stroll, age 17, a Kennedy campaign volunteer. They all survived. Robert Kennedy was rushed to a local hospital when un underwent emergency surgery and the assassin was identified as a 25-year-old Palestinian by the name of Sirhan Sirhan. First name and last name were the same. So as Kennedy's rushed to a local hospital to undergo emergency surgery, they have apprehended the shooter. 25, excuse me, 24-year-old Palestinian by the name of Sirhan Sirhan. 24, yeah. 24-year-old Palestinian by the name of Sirhan Sirhan. Well, remember, Kennedy was shot just a little bit after midnight on what day? June 5th, that evening at 5 o'clock. Kennedy's press secretary, Frank 
Mankiewicz, Mankiewicz, excuse me, Mankiewicz was asked to give a description of Kennedy's condition. At 5 p.m. on June 5th after surgery, RFK Press Secretary Frank Mankiewicz was asked to give a statement on Kennedy's condition. And this Kennedy's? Press Secretary, yep. At 5 o'clock on June 5th, RFK Press Secretary Frank Mankiewicz described Senator Kennedy's condition as, quote, extremely critical as to life. He described Kennedy's condition as extremely critical as to life. Now, what does that tell you the doctors were more concerned about? survival rather than recovery. They had given up at that point that he would recover to normal and they were much more concerned about survival rather than recovery. Well, it became very clear by 11 p.m. that night that Senator Kennedy was dying and would not survive. It was just a matter of time. So by 11 p.m. on June 5, 1968, it became clear that, pres or that, excuse me, that Senator Kennedy was not going to survive this assassination attempt. Was he unconscious? Not really, by that time. So, at 1.59 a.m., which would be June 6th, this is Pacific Standard Time because he's in California, at 1.59 a.m. on June 6th, Press Secretary Mankiewicz, Mankiewicz made an announcement at 1.59 a.m. on June 6th, again that's Pacific Standard Time, Press Secretary Mankiewicz announced the following. You don't have to write it down, but you can listen to it. Quote, Senator Robert Francis Kennedy died at 1.44 a.m. today, June 6, 1968. With Senator Kennedy at the time of his death were his wife Ethel, his sisters Mrs. Stephen Smith and Patricia Lawford, brother-in-law Stephen Smith, and Mrs. John F. Kennedy. He was 42 years old. That's the comment Mankiewicz made. He was so shook up that he forgot that actually Senator Edward Kennedy was also present when his brother died, but he was so shook up and emotional he just forgot he and later apologized to the media. So, we have another death. Kennedy's body was taken for autopsy. There was no controversy. The autopsy was done in Los Angeles. Then he was loaded on an airplane that was provided by the White House and departed at 1.20 p.m. on June 6, 1968. So, Robert Kennedy's body was taken for an autopsy. It was then loaded on an airplane provided by the White House and departed at 1.20 p.m., which would be 1.20 in the afternoon, on June 6, 1968. His body was actually flown to New York City as the funeral was going to take place at St. Patrick's Cathedral there. Hello? Good, what's up? Okay. Okay. Yep, I'll do it. Nope. You bet. You bet. See it. Okay. Again, after Bobby's assassination, his body was flown to New York City and was taken to St. Patrick's Cathedral for funeral mass. The funeral mass occurred on June 8, 1968 at St. Patrick's Cathedral. And who gave the eulogy? No, nope, good guess. Who gave the eulogy? Senator Edward Kennedy gave the eulogy, and I'm going to read it to you. And he had a hard time. What's the motto of the Kennedys? Well, I'm going to show you footage of this, and you, he has some trouble getting this out. 
okay, which tells you how emotional it was. Here's how, here is the eulogy, part of the eulogy of Senator, Senator Edward Kennedy. My brother need not be idealized or enlarged in death what he was in life. He should be remembered simply as a good and decent man who saw wrong and tried to right it, who saw suffering and tried to heal it, who saw war and tried to stop it. Those of us who loved him and who take him to his rest today pray that what he was to us and what he wished for others will someday come to pass for all the world. As he said many times in many parts of this nation to those he touched and who sought to touch him, you probably heard this quote, some men see things as they are and say why, I dream things that never were and say why not. You'll see that quote in the area around where he's buried in D.C. when we're there in about five weeks. Probably one of the most touching things about this is after the funeral mass, Senator Kennedy's body was put on a train from New York City to Washington, D.C. as they would prepare to bury him in Arlington next to his brother. Now the train was several hours late because of the large crowds of people who lined the railroad tracks from New York City to Washington. You have to see this on video. From New York City to Washington, the railroad tracks are packed with people that entire distance paid respects. It's an incredible thing to see. The, the family commented, they were, some of the children were very little, as they looked out the window of the train all the way from New York City to Washington, people saluting, flying flags, holding up signs the entire way. Well, once in Washington, Robert Francis Kennedy was buried at 10 p.m. on June 8, 1968. He was buried at 10 p.m. on June 8, 1968, about 30 yards from President Kennedy. And you'll see it. Is that far away? Not that, yeah, just about 30 yards away. Oh. Yep. What do you think Ethel Kennedy did after the funeral, after the burial, excuse me, after the burial? Nope. Well, I don't. Maybe privately, she hosted a cocktail party with her close family friends to try to get the healing process to to go. So she had a cocktail party for her friends. Anybody? Sadie probably knows that she's been there. Maybe others. What does Robert Francis Kennedy's grave site look like? We know John has the eternal flame, pretty flamboyant. What's Bobby's? It's very simple. Simple white cross. Simple wooden white cross with a very simple uh, headstone. And that's the way he wanted it. That's what he chose in his talks with people. So a lone white cross marks the final resting place for Senator Robert Francis Kennedy, something he requested prior to his death. Now, the saddest thing is Robert Kennedy left ten children, his wife and a daughter on the way during his assassination. So he left his pregnant wife, Ethel, and their ten children. Now, the ironic thing about this, it's off the cuff, Corey Kennedy was the last Kennedy to be born of Robert Kennedy and Ethel, born after her father's assassination. It was her wedding that John Kennedy Jr. was flying to when he crashed his airplane and died with his wife and sister-in-law. Kennedy's have had some interesting bad karma. Now, two things resulted after Robert Kennedy's death of importance. Two things resulted after Kennedy's death. Two significant things. First of all, I kind of mentioned it before. The Secret Service began to protect not only presidents, but presidential candidates after Bobby Kennedy was killed. And they've done it ever since. If you're going to run for president campaign, you will receive Secret Service protection. That started after Bobby Kennedy's death. It also would leave the Democratic nomination process wide open in the upcoming election of 1968, which benefits which party? The Republicans. Okay, a lot of hopes were dashed when Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. Historians couldn't guarantee, but they will say that they believe clearly that Bobby Kennedy probably would have gained 
the Democratic nomination for president, and who knows what happens after that. Okay? Now, in the back of your mind, you must be thinking, what were Sirhan's motivations? Why did Sirhan Sirhan assassinate Bobby Kennedy? Well, I'm going to tell you what historians believe. Okay? Historians believe that Sirhan Sirhan shot Robert Kennedy for three reasons. Historians believe that Sirhan Sirhan shot Robert Kennedy for three reasons. First of all, his anti-Americanism attitude. Sirhan's anti-Americanism attitude. Now let's, before we get the next two reasons, what's an Arab? If you're an Arab. He was an Arab. He's Arabic. How well do they get along with Israel? Not at all. Okay? So the second reason historians believe Sirhan shot Robert Kennedy is he was a member of the Palestinian nation. He was an Arab. And the Arabs were not real hot on Bobby Kennedy's views, which will actually be number three. So, number one, his anti-Americanism attitude. The second reason Sirhan Sirhan shot Robert Kennedy is because he was a Palestinian and he was Arab himself. And the third reason is that Sirhan was upset at Senator Kennedy because what country have we supported forever between those two in the Middle East? Israel. We've always supported Israel. And Kennedy said publicly, if president, he would continue to support Israel. And that was the third reason historians gave for Sirhan shooting Senator Kennedy. He thought he was going to become president and would throw his support to Israel. Now, the date of the assassination was kind of significant. Okay? June 5th, 1967 was the first anniversary of the Six-Day War in the Middle East. June 5th, 1967 is when the, when the Six-Day War began. The assassination was the first anniversary of that. So the date was the first anniversary of the Six-Day War. Exactly a year later, it started on June 5th, 1967. Kennedy was assassinated on June 5th, 1968. Anybody know what the Six-Day War was? It's Arab neighbors. So, yes, Israel fought back the Arabs in that six-day war, and this just happened to be the first anniversary. Now, there was an author, this is kind of interesting, there was an author by the name of Lauren Coleman, who's on your ID sheet, who actually stated that it was his belief that this assassination of, Pres of, excuse me, of Senator Kennedy was the first act of what to take place on American soil? Terrorism. So author Lauren Coleman stated publicly that it was his belief that this assassination by Sirhan Sirhan of Senator Robert Kennedy was actually the first act of Arab terrorism to take place on American soil. That was his feeling. Now, of course they went and investigated Sirhan and at his home they found a diary. And this is what he wrote in his diary. This was found after the assassination. You don't have to write it down. My determination to eliminate RFK is becoming more and more of an unshakable obsession. RFK must die. RFK must be killed. Robert F. Kennedy must be assassinated. Robert F. Kennedy must be assassinated before 5 June 1968. That was found in a diary at Sirhan's home after the assassination. Now, Sirhan claimed that he, act he acted unconsciously. He said he never had any memory of the shooting, didn't remember it. Now, this was an interesting claim. You ever heard of hypnotic brainwashing? There was a movie out, maybe... A couple years ago, I don't remember, starring Denzel Washington. He was a military officer. And he had a good friend that served with him in the Middle East who was going to run for the vice presidency. And he had somehow had had a chip put in his head 
and was controlled by others around him. He was known as the Manchurian Candidate. Have you ever heard of that? There was actually a movie in the 60s made called The Manchurian Candidate. And then there was also a remake of that with Denzel Washington, I'd say three or four or five years ago. And what it basically states is that the CIA programs a person and tells them what to do. And Sirhan Sirhan, his claim led some people to believe that he was the Manchurian candidate. The man set out to assassinate the president, controlled by the CIA. Kind of a bunch of crap, whatever. Now, George Plimpton, who was one of the men who initially subdued Sirhan, was later quoted about Sirhan's demeanor. Okay? George Plimpton, one of the men who captured him after the shooting, commented that this was Sirhan Sirhan's demeanor as they captured him. Quote, unusually calm, peaceful, or dreamlike expression on his face amid all the terror and confusion. He claimed he was just very calm, very peaceful, had no real panic in his eyes, shot him, and that's the way it was. Okay? Does anybody have any questions on the assassination of Bobby Kennedy? Okay? What we're going to do now, if somebody would help me with the curtains, 